Here we go. Help a teacher Facebook live. And uh, man, I tell you what, I have a. Uh, I've been talking with a number of school districts and they've been in the Midwest. These last few that I've been talking to. And you know what? What's so exciting is they got their kids back. So many schools finally just got the kids back. I know here in Texas, I know I was talking to doc Brad early today. I know in Georgia, they've been back for a while and um, but like in Missouri and, and then I talked to another district in Montana that this uh, just this last week, their kids came back live for the first time since last spring and uh, look, I love it. Let me tell you that, you know, I know we got to be safe. We got to protect them, but for so many kids, like this is their family right there with their teachers. And I just love that they are, are back and connected with those people who just love them relentlessly and also teach them a little something once in a while as well. So today we have my new, it's official, my new bestie for the resty. Abby French on with us. And uh, here's the truth. Like I, I've never, I've never met her and I've never talked to her, but we have so many friends in common and the people we have in common. I love them. So I know that she's going to be awesome and I can't wait to chat it up with her. So here we go all the way. I'm in Houston, Texas, and she is coming to us from somewhere, somewhere out in the, in the sticks out in the woods in Virginia. Abby, how are you? Hi, how I'm great. I'm in Woodstock, Virginia, just so you can officially know the uh, For those of you map, map, map people. Yes. Yeah, I'm about and 90 minutes outside of D.C. in uh, the beautiful Shenandoah Valley. All right. So as a history teacher there in the middle school, we got so much to talk about. Before we get to anything, we've got to talk about something that I saw online. And frankly, I find it disconcerting. And I saw you with a snake. Is, tell me, tell me that wasn't you. Was that you? It was me, Hal. Jeez, yeah, I, I, you know how some people like to help turtles across the road. <laughs> right. It's really, it's not any different. It isn't any different. It's just that I am a nature science girl at heart, even though I teach history, and um, you know, I like to help. I like to help my friends out. Right. Well, here's the thing. So when I was attending college. I don't know if I was really attending. I was just kind of hanging out. I we there's a there's a guy that lived next door who was so passionate about herpetology that was his yeah, thing. Yeah, that's, that's it. And because he was so passionate, everybody in the dorm got super passionate because he was passionate, and he was ordering all kinds of snakes from Tom Crutchfield in Florida and flying them in, and like he's selling and we're buying snakes. And I ended up, I ended up with a python. Okay. And that lasted a couple of years really? until I found, yeah, because I, I mean, what am I going to do with this thing? And I, it got to like, it's inconvenient. Wow. And I ended up having to give it, to, I gave it, I gave it to the high school biology teacher there in Lubbock, Texas. That's and awesome. And they had a huge, huge thing, whatever snakes live in. So that's my limited experience. A habitat. Um, that's awesome. I really love that story. I really, really do. Yeah. I, I just like to help, you know, people are scared. A lot of people scared of snakes, need yeah. a little bit of help. Uh, I'd rather relocate them than see them hacked or whatever else is done. So yeah, that's it. Hey, there's Trisha's sense. She is Trisha Kia. She's, she's one of my faves, man. She is in upstate New I York and that. she's saying they go back tomorrow. Can you imagine? I, I can imagine. She is in New York. They might have to dig a tunnel through the snow or something. That's I'm not true. sure how they do that all right so here's what i want to talk about is um let's kick it off with this okay. so many teachers i find in the classroom they came into teaching simply because when they were in school they loved it and it was easy and they were super successful and they had a trapper keeper that matched their bow in their hair and they participated and they were captain of this team and the drill team and the whole bit. And, and they went to college and thought, you know what, I'm just going to keep doing this because I'm so good at it. It comes so easy for me. And they find, and they end up in the classroom and when they end up on day one, they realize, Oh my gosh, there's one person in this room. Like might be like me, they have one or two students, but everybody else is very different. And what I'm curious is, was that your experience as well, or was it very different than that? Well, I can relate to the nice, neat trapper keeper at the beginning of the school year, because that was like the thing that symbolized my hope for this year, I'm going to get it right. But 
that's <laughs> where the connection stops because school was not, uh, it was not a good place for me in terms of uh, how I felt about myself. Um, it was actually the opposite. I, I ended up uh, finding out I had a learning disability when I was in middle school. It was a very tumultuous time through um, elementary school and up through that time period. Um, I could never see, it was like whack-a-mole with, uh, you know, focus on one grade and get it up and then the other grades drop, you know, and then the report card comes out and the grades and the, and all the worry and the stress and the feeling of letting my parents down or letting teachers down, uh, embarrassed in front of my friends, you know, um, all of that was just, it was really awful. <laughs> Yeah, And I went into education, not because I loved it, but really because I had some very significant people that stepped in at, at really just kind of the right moments that helped me transform a lot of negative thinking about myself and really teach me skills and accommodations for how I learned best. And so I was able to transform that. And I my college essay app, you know, for applications getting in was all it was titled turning stumbling blocks into stepping stones. So that's been my thing. Man, I love it so much. You know, just um, I love that kids have you, you know, I've always said, especially that age where you're at sixth grade, like the biggest fear of all is for a kid that age for most of them I have found is the fear of humiliation. Just oh, the fear. So, so self so self-aware right and so yep. it's such a uh hindrance in a sense right yeah and, and you know i and and to and to put yourself in the position of that kid sitting in the center of the classroom surrounded by every peer really in their life at this point right. and the feeling of those people get it and those people are nodding along and i have no idea what's happening that is terrifying for a kid it really is and i don't think that we can ever get too far away from remembering that um, because it, it truly is traumatizing for a, a student to be called out to be, um, I don't know, kind of filleted in front of the other students or just to lose that faith in themselves when um, my feeling is that we've got to be doing more to help students like celebrate who they are, be more of themselves and yeah. express it. And I've always said, you know, like, you know, coming into a classroom as an educator, I think I didn't, I definitely didn't think about it this way when I first started, but now that I'm a half a century old and I have kids and all that, you know, it's, it, I'm not, I'm not there to change anybody, man. I'm, I'm really want to empower the kid yeah. to uncover who they really are and to find that's that it. greatness. Like I'm trying to flip on the light so they can see it. That is, that's it like to find their talents, to find the strengths, to find the things that make them like what they think about, what they love doing, what the place that they feel um, most secure in who they are and to celebrate that and then create learning experiences that include that, that allow them to show that. Yeah. You know, it, it brings up for me so many thoughts about, just that regulated classroom, the, the typical thing, when you think about school, it's a typical classroom where we're sitting in rows and columns in alphabetical order, and we're all doing the same thing at the same time. And we, you know, we talk about differentiation all the time, but really it comes down to we're all doing the same thing at the same time. We're all going to take the same test, no matter the personality, no matter the DNA of the kid, no matter the strengths, the talents, none of that matters. They have to fit into this one tiny box in so many classes, and I just feel so bad for those kids. Right, like, right, we keep trying, a lot of traditional education has been trying to make cookie cutter, you know, experiences and kids fit into that instead of fitting it the other way around um, and enhancing, enhancing education to bring out the very best in the students, yeah. not the other way around. Yeah, you know, and, um, you know, the more I think about assessment, you know, in the past, just growing up, I never had the feeling when I, when I was in school, and this is like in the late seventies, early eighties, I'm trying to think back and I never really had the feeling anybody was trying to figure out what I knew. It was almost as if this was a puzzle to catch me at like what I didn't know. Right. Oh, always. 
I mean, yeah. just the terror of being called on, you know, and 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 it like they feel the feeling that the teacher knew exactly the person to call on that didn't know. Yeah. You know, and that was it was like they had a special like sensor or something. But yeah, you know, what I have been really passionate about in my um in my own practice has been moving away from traditional assessment, moving away from traditional grading practices and embracing um, you know, alternative assessments, performance task assessments. Uh, I'm currently piloting a um, proficiency-based grading uh, reporting system. And believe me, anytime you pilot something, there's a lot of bumps. I mean, it's been a bumpy, bumpy road, but, but I believe in the essence of it. And I believe that communicating learning progression without points and percentages there's a lot to learn there and a lot to be supported. Yeah. You know, I keep thinking back to just, especially in the earlier grades, how sometimes those assessment, you know, traditional assessment, like a homework or a quiz or a test is just more evidence for a kid that, it, that reinforces where they are. If they're successful in school, it reinforces that you are a successful student. Right. But if they're not, it's just, it's not, no, a kid, Dude, like a teacher has now data to prove that they suck at school. <laughs> yes, that's yes. Instead of like figuring out, here's the information that I really need you to know. I need you to get these connections. I need you to know this essential stuff, right? And then how do you want to show me that you get it? I don't care. Yeah. I don't care if it's a traditional assessment or if it's something that you're super passionate about like filmmaking. If you want to show me the thing that you are talented in, then use that. Like, I don't, I need to know, you know, the stuff you can tell me how you want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always talking about, you know, as an educator, it's really, for me, it's using the content of the classroom. Like that's the vehicle to teach this ultimate lesson we want the kid to learn. And it, you know, and, you know, for a while there, I taught um, biology. Well, I shouldn't say that. I was sponsoring a biology class. I don't want to insult any biology teachers <laughs> by calling myself a biology teacher. But, you know, I, you know and, and yeah, of course, man, I, if I could stuff some knowledge into the noggin, that's awesome. But more than that, right. you know, I wanted, I wanted to use this class as a kid, as a way for these kids to find out about passion and, and purpose and, and just being awesome people along the way. And, and I'm wondering for you, because this is such, such a powerful time to be a history teacher. You know, when, oh. when, kids are, when kids are thinking back on your class, like what are those main things you want them to remember? Okay. That is a huge question, and I'm ready. Um, I, want, I want my students, especially in this time period where we are right now, I want my students to be skilled in, uh, I believe, using empathy, historical empathy as a, like as a critical thinking skill, to be able to analyze historical events, motives, people, behaviors, to better understand where we are right now. I want them to be able to use information and those critical thinking skills, and like I said, specifically empathy, to be able to connect to things outside themselves and then contextualize what we're seeing right now. Man, it's powerful. I love that. Um, you know, and this is so much for a kid to handle. I just can't even imagine being in sixth grade and watching the news and watching what's going down and just hearing both sides yell back and forth and call each other names <laughs> to be a child and thinking that, well, the hell, well, that's what we do on the school bus. I, I just think like, you know, one of the things that we've got, we are, I believe is a call to action as educators right now is to do um, a much better and intentional job of, of helping our students discern um, and uh, be able to have like civil discourse, be able to give them skills to be able to debate, to be able to look at, at information, find out it's, it's, whether it's factual, find out where it comes from, um, be able to analyze it, be able to go outside their own thinking to look at others 
and then to to find and to find like where they stand on issues. I think that's really really important. But there's a lot of critical <clears throat> thinking skills and intentional uh, work that teachers and education has to do to be able to equip these students. It's it's got to be like a main. I mean, if we've learned anything over the last four years and currently in the last few weeks is that we have got to help our students um, learn, learn about debate in a healthy way, learn about uh, information and processing it and being able to communicate that with other people uh, that think differently for the betterment of of our communities and it's a classroom community a school community our community communities and 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 broader um yeah but we are really lacking in that ability as a nation you know i think it for me just watching these historical moments that happen day in and day out right now is is you know, the, the first thing it is disappointing, but what I get excited about is that is just remembering that our leaders of tomorrow are sitting in our classrooms today. Yeah, that's the exciting part. And like, it seems like there's no hope or no answer, but wait a minute, there is a hope. And the answer is we have all of them right now. We have the next generation sitting in front of us every day. So that's the that's the exciting part, and that's hope. And I think you're right. You know, those three things of of um, you know, discerning and discern and debate and discourse. I mean, is powerful. The three Ds. The three Ds. We just coined it. Yeah. How done? <laughs> hey, what, the other thing I want to talk about um, as we're as we're coming to the close is this idea of school culture. And how mm -hmm. powerful that is and the, the, what kids feel when they cross the threshold and come into the school building and, and how some campuses can be extraordinarily toxic and people can't really figure out why. And other places are just absolutely magical. And and for you, I'm wondering in um, in your practice, and I love that you call it a practice. What, what 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 makes the difference for you to to make that shift from a place mm -hmm. that feels toxic to one that is is great and magical for kids and teachers? Well, this is my thing, Hal. Um, I want. I'll tell you what makes it magical. It's no mag. There's no science. It's no special gimmick. There's no branding. There's no, um, you know, program. You don't need any of that junk. It really comes down to this. Kids, just every single one of them, every single student, it's really simple. They just need to be seen. They need to be seen. They need to know that the person that is running the show, the person that's whose, whose room, whose building, whose cafeteria they're in, whose gym, is a safe place and that they are valued as a member of that community that space that they have a voice that they are safe that they are celebrated and it's just not a mystery literally look at the individuals and recognize who they are and make them know that allow them empower them to to like tell their story to own their strengths and talents like we talked about earlier um, you are probably mastered in that as an alternative ed teacher. Like, you know the power of helping a kid who doesn't own themselves, who doesn't see value in themselves, like being championing that kid until they can champion themselves. That's what it is. It's no mystery. That's it right there. Isn't it interesting how, you know, we, we, we do studies and there's research and we have curriculums and people want to know which program is best for this. And we're trying to commit. And it's like, Oh my gosh, it's there. Just show, show me the teacher and I'll tell you how that program is going to go. You know, it, mm -hmm. it, it really is. I, and I, I don't want to oversimplify it because it does take some commitment and consistency, consistency with, just the teacher with an amazing heart and a passion for making a difference and really wanting to be the one to make a difference in the lives of kids. But once we get that past that part, that's, I mean, it's, it's, it's incredibly fun when you walk into a place like that and join that kind of family who's there for kids. It's it. You're right. 
It is. Yeah. And it's an honor. I mean, honestly, it's, it's, it is humbling to share that space with a young individual at this, that stage in their life who, you know, you don't know how, what they're going to do as an adult. And I don't mean that I am like the, the, you know, the, I just mean it's, it is an honor to share space with, with that person for a year. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, for me, like I get overwhelmed sometimes just thinking about it. Like, oh my gosh, I, the role that we get to play, like it's this kid's in the incubator, man. And my, the incubator is right. my classroom. <laughs> oh my gosh. Like what, for one I, year of their life. It's a crazy responsibility. And opportunity. That's the thing. And here's the part it's for me. Um, I didn't, I know I didn't think about it enough when I first started, but I was for, you know, I'm fresh out of college and I'm 22 and I have no business, you know, having kids sit in front of me. And I didn't think about it then. And then I got to the part like, Oh my gosh, how powerful of an opportunity is this? And now that I've been around for so long, it's terrifying because mm -hmm. it goes both oh, ways. Right. It is absolutely terrifying because those kids remember everything. Yeah, they do. And I, and I, I didn't always understand it. Like when I started teaching, I, you know, I, I heard all of the old traditional, you know, don't smile till October. You, once you loosen up things in your classroom, you can never get it back. Uh, you know, you got to classroom management, classroom management, classroom management. And I, I guess it was a few years ago after I attended a conference on, um, it was a, um, conference on 21st century education and um and learning right and i saw ted dinnersmith speak and it was phenomenal and it really changed my whole thinking but what i realized was um what i realized was was students were, were needed to be at the center and um it isn't classroom management that we should be worrying about it's classroom leadership we should be empowering our students. We don't need classroom management skills. We need classroom leadership skills that we are imparting on our kids with our students. Yeah. Man, I talk about this so much and it is so true. I mean, just the word management just, ugh, it just Yeah, right? Like, Gag me. Ew, who wants to They're be managed? Managed term. Right, I don't. Like who like I just want to know what teacher thought to themselves when they when they had the epiphany that they're going to do this teaching thing and they're sitting on their bed you know, and to think, you know, like who, who among us thought someday when I grow up, I'm going to manage pre and or post pubescent children. Like no one has that thought, you know, Ew. right. No, no. It, it's, it's all about leadership and, you know, in, in any other profession, you know, they don't call it the manager of the free world. You know, they don't call it a religious manager. It's a religious leader. It's not a scout manager, right. the scout leader. Right. But in, in the leadership is twofold. I mean, it's not just you as the teacher as a classroom leader at all. It's about teaching those students leadership skills so that they can move through the next years as a leader of their own learning yeah. and contributing member of any community they're in. Powerful stuff, man. Hey, let me ask you, what do you, what, um, in this moment of your career, in this season of your career and with the kids you have and what's going on in our society and culture and everything that's going on in the world, as you're looking to the future, as you're looking, you know, to this 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 semester, moving to the next next year, what are you what are you excited about? What's on your mind? Well, I am excited about getting out of the phase we're in right now, Hal. Yeah. Okay, I'm excited to get out of hybrid learning and quarantining and this little weave and dance we've been doing. And I'm excited to do experiential learning. I'm excited about place-based learning. That's kind of where I'm like, that was what I was starting to like flirt with uh, right before COVID about wanting to get kids uh, doing history, wanting to get kids uh, creating and producing. And a lot of that involves collaboration, right? It almost all of it involves collaboration. And we've certainly had to, um, look at that differently over the last year year so i'm really excited for when we can kind of let let loose a little bit yeah me too this is um 
You know, for me, education, you know, what I have really found is when I'm really um, sinking some knowledge into the kid and, and having an impact on the kid's heart is it's just built on that connection, a sense of connection and relationship. And I, and I think I do an OK job maybe online, but man, like I right. missed it. Oh, like I, I know. Miss it. Yeah, I yeah, I and, yeah. and as much as I miss it, what's even more sad than that is, um, man, those kids need it. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they sure yeah. do. And what I love is, um, I just love at this at this crazy time in in our history, in our nation's history, and the lives of our kids. I love. I can't even imagine how awesome it'd be to be uh, with you in your classroom, whether that's online, in person, or some wacky hybrid of the two. <laughs> and um, thank you. And, and I appreciate you so much joining us tonight. It's an honor to be here and talk with you. I really, I'm so glad that we did this. Yeah. All right. It's official. We're friends now. Admit it. Actually, you can call me Abby. I'm in. Thank you so much. Uh-huh. Yeah. Take care. Bye.